This is the Hewlett Packard ThinkJet 2225. This is one of the earliest, if not the first, commercially available inkjet printers that was available. Uh, it's adorably tiny for just how simplified it is. If you wanted good looking text, but it was going to be loud, you got Daisy Wheel. If you wanted excellent looking text, but you wanted crazy amounts of money, you got yourself a laser printer. If you wanted cheap, but not really all that good um, quality printouts, text or graphics, you got yourself a dot matrix. And then this little thing came along here and it was fantastic because it could do fairly decent graphics, fairly decent text. It was quiet and it was cheap. The other thing the 2225 has going for it is that it has a variety of interfaces that are available for it. This one here has a Centronix printer interface on the back of it. It does, however, have an external AC adapter. You can get these with a built-in rechargeable battery. Other options that you could get for it was HPIL, which was HP's fancy little loop interface that you could get for their calculators and such. You could also get yourself serial for devices that could only output to serial printers. And you could also get it in GPIB, or as Hewlett Packard liked to call it, HPIB. It was extremely flexible. You could take it with you in your briefcase or your bag. You could use it in a temporary location with your test equipment or you could have it permanently set up inside of your uh, office or in your library or such. Actually, these things were quite popular for quite a long time for their ability to just make off receipt labels and the, and the likes, especially for shipping labels as well. And the reason for that is because this doesn't take friction feed paper. It is actually a tractor feed mechanism. If you've never seen tractor feed paper, um, I actually have some hiding over here. It, it, it likes to do that. Tractor feed paper simply has these perforations on the side here, which are supposed to tear away when you apply certain amounts of pressure to them. And then when you're done with your printing, you can just grab them and pull them away and you get yourself a proper piece of paper without any horrible tears or marks on them. These printers here are also usable for 99% of all real world applications in the office, in the library, in the shipping place, at home, wherever the hell you want it, like I said. But there are fields of work where this printer is just simply not secure enough. When you think about an encrypted data stream or like a secure connection, we're usually thinking about a message or a document sent from point A to point B, and it's scrambled so the connection all the way through cannot be intercepted, decoded, and viewed by anybody. The problem is when you try and do the last leg, because for a lot of these tasks, suddenly it's very difficult to prevent the information from not being disclosed to parties who really shouldn't be looking at it. Uh, with a video display, you can visually see it. Okay, that's fine. So we just kind of put diffusers on the screen so you can't look at it from certain angles. Um, but then it gets even wilder than that. And even printers like this, where you'd expect it's a digital signal coming straight in through a cable and being printed out immediately. There is a certain amount of EMI emissions that are being given off that after many decades of research, you can actually decode what's happening. So a secure message can come in, it can be decrypted, and in that last little leg to the printer, someone still is able to intercept it. This is a problem, especially in high security applications. The military and the CIA are two particular examples there of extreme levels of security that must be maintained end to end. And as a result, the along with NATO here in North America, have a set of guidelines for how to protect the data from end to end. And that is to not only shield and encrypt the data as it goes from point A to point B, but also to protect it from EMI emissions, audible noise capturing, and other absolute mind-blowing madness you and I will never have to deal with in our lives. Um, and this is called Tempest. Tempest is not an acronym. Tempest is the name of the guidelines required for these various devices, electronic and what have you, being used in these high security applications it ensures that the data transmission remains intact. You can apply for being Tempest certified and to produce products that are Tempested in that regard so that you can sell into these government markets. 
but even that requires a ridiculous amount of security clearance and it requires regular audits and it's pretty wild. And at the same time, the actual specifications are not really public, even though Tempestine equipment for various uses has been done now for decades, almost coming up on a century now, uh, it's still quite classified. So every so often we do get a little bit of Tempest hardware that shows up for sale somewhere, and it's just wild what we've seen. Like, I have seen now multiple Macintosh computers that have been Tempested. As simple as having, like, a copper plating inside of the case and a little protective cover that goes over the floppy drive and the hard drive, as well as shielding on the back of it. I've seen this actually happen on the IBM PC as well. One of the more wild systems I've seen in the last couple of years that went up for sale that was Tempested, it was a Macintosh Plus. Um, it was ridiculous just how much of the system was now integrated into a massive blob that looked more like a very bloated Lisa, but it also came with a printer. And the printer didn't use shielded electrical cabling like we'd expect. It used a fiber optic link. It used light to transfer between the computer and the printer. And that was one way that you could solve the problem of any EMI emissions coming out of the cable and being intercepted. There's other companies out there that were producing uh, their own versions of products that if you wanted it in Tempest, you could get it, but it cost you several thousand dollars more. And the HP ThinkJet is one such product that was available from another vendor that was available in Tempest form factor. So I'm going to set this off to the side here. Let's keep an eye on what this looks like here. Again, let's just kind of, this is what it looks like. It's all plastic. It's all fairly standard looking stuff to keep it cheap, but at the same time effective. What does the Tempest version of this printer look like? It looks like this. This is actually from the Dataset Corporation. It's called the DSP-225 Tempest Printer. It is a heavy metal box. It is easily three times the weight of a regular ThinkJet, and that's just because it's entirely shielded. The only openings that are on this here is at the very top here is a shielded slit, which is allowing the paper to go into the printer, get printed, and then come out of that one spot. And then hiding on the back of this printer here, I don't know if it's just because of how I received it or not, there's actually a hole that's right here. I think there's usually a piece of foil tape that's supposed to go inside of there. I would take this apart. However, it is exactly the same inside as the regular ThinkJet with the exception of some buffers and filters that are on the data interface. And this one doesn't have serial or parallel. This one is using HPIB. HPIB cables themselves are rather nice and heavily shielded devices. They're because, well, in a laboratory environment, you probably need that shielding. What's funny about this cable here is that even though it mates up and you can screw it in securely and it's shielded end to end, because it has this open data port on the end here, this is surprisingly not a Tempest rated cable. There's actually versions of this that don't have the port on the back of it. That way it's completely shielded all the way along. Now I should bring it up right now. The reason this one here has an HPIB or GPIB interface is because one of the places I commonly see these printers are on grid laptops. And for many years people said all grid laptops are military grade. They're like EMI suppressed. They're fantastic. This is untrue. Uh, if you have a grid compass, then you can actually plug this printer into your laptop. This one here, however, is a rather standard grid case. If you wanted to get a grid laptop in Tempest, you could. But again, it cost you a heck of a lot more money, and the ports and the way this thing works are all completely different. One thing is that you can remove the power supply on this. But if I put this off to the side here again, if we take a look at the back of this printer here, we have an AC 120, 240 volt connection right here. The power supply is built into it. And if we remember from the older ThinkJet here, which is not Tempested, it uses an external AC adapter. So that's an immediate no-go right there. That's also probably one of the reasons why it's so heavy. Uh, along with the bajillion screws here, we also have the slot that's hanging out here in the top. Uh, this window is so you can actually see what's being printed. Now, just like what you get with a microwave oven, there's a metal screen that's in front of that window so that no EMI uh, noise from the printer 
can make its way out through that window. Kind of like how with a plasma TV, um, those things are absolute EMI generators. They're, they're terrible in that regard, even though the picture looks absolutely fantastic. When the paper is coming out of this slot, you may ask, is there anything preventing emissions from here? Well, it's also a much deeper slot here than you'd have with this here. So I'm assuming that's a level of shielding. There's also a metal plate that's hiding inside of here that prevents all of the electronics from here getting direct access to this hole. So even if you have to bounce it over, it's a lot less likely. It's also on spring-loaded hinges as well because the whole front of the unit, instead of having a plastic door, has a heavy metal door, surprise. And if I swing it open here, we actually do see the standard Hewlett Packard ThinkJet mechanism hiding inside of here. And this is that metal plate that I was talking about right here. There's also a warning that's hiding back here that specifically says disruption of the Tempest seals on this equipment will void the DataSec Tempest warranty. What it's referring to there is on this side of the machine, you can kind of see these checker marks here. I had to peel the security seals off of this. I had to get inside of this printer. But this would tell you that someone had opened up the printer without authorization. Again, it could be that someone's bugged your printer or otherwise compromised the Tempest security on it. And of course, you may be looking at the buttons that are on the very top here, which if we go back to the ThinkJet, you can see are exactly the same. This printed membrane set of switches here is actually sitting on top of a metal plate with a very thin slit so that the ribbon cable can disappear inside. The outside of this is protected with a metal plate, so one, it doesn't come off, and two, so it provides the additional shielding. This is just the extra set of switches. I can only assume the physical switches inside are buffered so that whatever signals are being generated cannot erroneously or via interference make their way back out and turn the buttons into an antenna. Yes, I am aware there is a level of severe paranoia here, but again, it has been proven, it's written, and there's a reason why these specifications exist. Little things like this are the reason why data security breaches and leaks have occurred in some pretty wild ways. It's not as crazy as people like saying that you can read data off of a hard drive by the sounds they make, though I'm pretty sure at some point in the history of hard drives that was actually the case. I don't think there really is much else that I can talk about now with these printers. Uh, functionally, they are identical. Uh, they take the exact same commands, who would be surprised? Um, they take the exact same printer cartridges, who would be surprised? Really, the only difference here is that one is your consumer price that supplies, well, 99% of the market, and then there's the 1% right here who need the very heavy-duty, well-built, and extremely expensive Tempest certified units. Both of these printers, however, have the exact same problem. And in fact, it's not limited to these here. I have another printer here I'm just gonna to use to demonstrate this with. This is a Kodak Diconix 150 Plus portable inkjet printer. This one actually also has batteries inside of it too. It hides back here, but just like before, it can do tractor feed, and functionally it's the exact same as all of these other printers too. What am I complaining about here? Well, you see, Hewlett Packard's ink is very peculiar. Um, it's corrosive. Uh, and if you watch other YouTube videos on these ThinkJet printers, the same problem comes up again and again and again and again and again. And for this DataSec printer here, it is the exact same issue. Uh, these ink cartridges are actually still available. Um, you can get them online. They're fairly cheap. There's no DRM with them. But the problem is, is that there's still a lot of these inkjet cartridges that are still in these printers, whether it be the Diconics, the ThinkJet, or the DataSec printer here. And the problem is, is that after many years sitting there, the ink is corrosive to the print heads. And that causes the ink to start weeping down and reach the contacts on the cartridge. Now, this can destroy the contacts on the cartridge, and then you're basically forced to buy a new cartridge, not to mention it's leaking and can often leave a ton of ink inside of there as a stain. But for each and every single printer here, they have the exact same style of carriage, which holds that little tiny cartridge inside of it. And that's a problem because when it gets down in there, there is a single ribbon cable that goes from the single printed circuit board inside that controls the entire printer uh, to the print head. And for many years, you could, you could buy these new uh, as replacement parts. You cannot do it anymore. 
the ink will destroy the contacts on this ribbon cable. So all of the traces on there are perfectly fine. I actually have multiple of these ribbon cables here just to give you an example. Like the traces are fine, but again, much like with secure transmissions, the last leg is always the critical point. The like half an inch or quarter of an inch or even far more minuscule path from the trace to the pad that the print head and the printer cartridge connects with has been eaten away by this corrosive ink. So these ribbons here are completely useless. You cannot buy these ribbons anymore. They are completely out of uh, end of life. Uh, there is a substitute that you can use in there. It's kind of janky. It's not wired the exact same way. You need to make an adapter to rewire the pins on one side to fit into the connector. And you have to actually modify the carriage so you can fit the ribbon in there and mount it correctly. Um, in 2025, I would really appreciate it if someone had actually tried to make new flex ribbons so we can fix these printers more readily. Uh, and there are companies out there. Um, I can't name any off the top of my head. Actually, yes, I can. Let's say PCBWay offering flat flex ribbon cable solutions. I don't have the knowledgeable skills to be able to make those myself, but it's nice to know that these options are available. Anyways, I really hope that you enjoyed this video. Um, it's kind of neat to own both the commercial and the Tempest version of the exact same printer. I hope we learned a little bit more here about what Tempest means and what a Tempest version of a consumer product looks like. And I hope you're a little bit more informed on why buying these printers here may result in you getting multiples because they're all going to have probably bad ribbon cables. Uh, thank you for watching, and until next time, have a good one.